morning. Good crowd. A good-looking bunch today. Would all the good-looking people please say amen? amen? All right. Now I know who thinks they're good-looking, right? There you go. Take your Bible out and go ahead and turn to the book of Colossians. We're going to be in chapter 4 down there towards the end, verses 7 through 18. I'm going to go ahead and tell you today I'm going to make up the pronunciation of most of these names because I have a hard time. You know, I don't know why everybody can't pronounce the name. I mean, when you see C-I-R-L-O-T, everybody knows that. Celo, right? I mean, so when, when I try to put that in verses and read these names, it just doesn't come out the same way that other people do. So y'all, y'all can snicker at me when I read later on. That'll be okay. Um, I'm, what, I'm, what we're going to look at today, and the main thing you're going to take away from the message today is this, that all saints, and the letter was written to the saints, which means the letter was written to the Christians. So if you're a born-again believer of Jesus Christ, this message is for you today. It's been given to you, it's been given to me, so that we can use this information. Now, all saints, every person who's a born-again believer of Jesus Christ within the church has uh, needs relationships in order for us to become who we're supposed to become and so that we can do what God has created us to do in our lives. Now, I've got to say up front that this is probably one of the most difficult messages that I ever have to deliver to you because because of my personal makeup of who I am. Now, don't think the preacher said he wears makeup. That's not what I'm talking about. When I talk about makeup, you know, some of y'all know I'm different from everybody else in a lot of aspects, but I'm like other people in a lot of aspects. There's two things that you may have figured out about me by now, or you may not have figured out about me. Number one is, I'm extremely an introvert. You say, well, how in the world can you be an introvert and be in front of all these people and preach? Notice I'm in front of you over here, and you are over there, okay? So I'm most comfortable in front of people and drawn away from from people, I'm at my ease. I'm in best, my best spot. The other thing I want you to know about me is I am very extremely analytical. Every time somebody says something, every time something help happens, my brain goes into hyperactivity so that I can try to figure out all of the things that are taking place so that I can know exactly what's going on in the surrounding all around me. That is why on numerous occasions, my wife, Tynell, will look at me and say, Steve, you think too much. And some of y'all were thinking, I don't even think at all, right? (laughs) But now when you take those two things and you combine them together and you also combine them together with my brain is not necessarily made like everybody else's brain. Back in the 1950s and all this, people didn't know that smoking and drinking alcohol and all that kind of stuff when you were carrying children had an effect on the babies and that kind of stuff. So my mom, you know, my dad and the way that they were, they lived their lives and what have you. When I came to this world, parts of my brain don't work like the other parts of my brain. Now I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me because my brain doesn't work like everybody else because God has a way of taking different parts of your brain and use them wherever he's got to so that you can make up for your, short, for your shortcomings and other places, which is one of the reasons I got some analytical stuff that goes on on the wrong side of my brain, but it works and I'm okay with it. But because of that, I have this inability to remember the names of things. You know, you, you got, any of you guys ever here work, work on your car? And have you ever gone to the auto parts place? The first thing that they ask you when you go in an auto parts house is, they say, what kind of car you got? And I, I'll get there, and I can't remember what the name of that Chevrolet thing is. It's a Silverado. It's a 19, and then I can't remember because I can't assign the name. And then they'll say, well, what kind of parts you want? And I'll say, I need a set of those things that you put in, that you put the wire onto, I call it a thingamajig. Some people call it a gizmo or a thingamabob. It's a spark plug is what I'll be trying. That's the reason that I preach from notes when I stand in front of you because I often lose, not only do I lose your name, I lose my own name. I lose my kid's name. I'm continually calling my dog by one of the kid's names or one of the kids by my dog's name. Because all that stuff gets jumbled up in my brain. But that's just the way that it is. You got issues too. And all the people with issues said, all right, okay, so that's that's why. That's what makes us his reason. But because of that, when it comes to relationships, I'm just not real good at relationships. And I've been working on this all my life. And I, 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 I know that I need people. And I know that you make me a better person. And I know that I make you a better person as we come together. Because a lot of things you and I do, they're awkward. But we try to make all of that stuff come together. And that can be seen so well in the Apostle Paul It's unbelievable how much we see this. Every time Paul writes a letter, in the letter he'll say, this is coming from me, and if it gets to the end of the letter, he'll name five, six, seven, eight people 
that that letter is coming from. So-and-so, uh, uh, Onesimus or, or Ephorus sends this letter with me, and he wants to send you these things. So what you find out is Paul has this tremendous network of individual people that he's doing ministry with. And every single one of those people is valuable and important. And the, the, what God wants to do cannot be done without each one of those people that are contained in, in that area that God has brought them together in. Now, we see that. And, and again, I always want to notice how the miracle of how God brings text together at just the right time in the right places. Now, one thing about people is all people have a built-in need for other people. Now, I know some of you who are introverts in here today are going to say, wait a minute, you know, I'm better, I'm better when I'm by myself. If I'm going to go fishing, I'd rather go buy my fishing by myself or something like that. Now, that, I know you like to be by yourself sometimes, but sometimes you still need people. And by that, I want you to understand that there's a thing called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Anybody ever heard that term before? Psychologists will use this. When one of the things that you have a need in your life is everybody needs to be loved. Everybody has the emotional need that they just need somebody to love them. And if you don't believe me, just remember when you were in your, in your preteens, when you were growing up and you were going in that situation where, you know, you, just, you go home to your mama and you say, everybody hates me. Nobody loves me. I can remember tell, telling that to my mama, you know, and then she made it better. She said, why don't you just go outside and eat some worms? You know, because that's why. But the reason you and I felt like that, and some of us still feel like that from time to time, is because we got this built-up need inside of us to be loved by other people. Now, God did that because he wants people in love to come together and use those other people that are different from you and different from me to mold you into me into who he wants us to be so that we can accomplish what he's called us to accomplish in our lives. We can't do that if, if we don't do that. Now, you think about your social makeup. Let's just think about Jackson County or, or Mississippi or, or the South or uh, in general. Everything we do has to do with relationships. Uh, uh, if you think about it, we have in all, all across Mississippi, there's places where we have lodges. You know, you call it a hunting lodge, but then a lot of places you got these different lodges. These guys get together and they got these secret handshakes and they've got this information they're passing on. But they come together because they want to be a group so that they'll have some people that they can interact with. Now, those of you who are on the other scene in Jackson County, you maybe you maybe you're one of these ladies that belongs to a sorority. So you join your sorority, so you got a group of people you can get together. So you have a party at your house and all the people can come. It's all about the relationships. You got to get your house ready for them to come to your house, and then you go out and you go and have these banquets and things. Or we've got these things in Jackson County we call bars. You know what bars are? Anybody in here ever been in a bar? I was looking to see. Okay, there we go. We got one honest, one honest person at Ridgeley Heights Baptist Church. You know, some people think that people go to bars so that they can get alcohol. But, you know, really and truly, it'd be a whole lot easier to go to a, a packaged liquor store and get you some alcohol than it would be to go to a bar. You don't go to a bar to get alcohol. You go to a bar so you can get something to drink and be around people so that you can talk to the bartender, so you can talk around to the other people who are at the bar, so you can talk about the junk and the stuff that's going on in your life. You know, if, if you don't believe that, you remember that program back there in the 1980s? Uh, what was the name of that bar in Chicago? Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. You remember all the relationships that were built up in that thing? Because people have got to have relationships with other people. You know, when we talk about team sports, we talk about baseball, y'all have people that travel around with you, families that go to a whole ball game situation, clubs, sports. Even, even think about this, gangs. You know, you go into a city and you got gangs. we got them right here in our own county, but you go into big cities, you got big gangs. You know what those gangs do? They got each other's back. All right, they got tattoos to mark them so that we can know who their brothers are so that they can take care of those who are in that gang. See, all of these things exist because everybody has a need to have these people in their lives. Because without these people, we can't be who God created us to be. Now, the Bible is absolutely emphatic that we need people. You go from chapter 1, and chapter 1, God says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You get to chapter 2, but you don't get very far in that chapter, God says about the man that he created, it is not good for the man to be alone. So it creates somebody else. Because God knows that it, we have to have people in our lives 
so that we can become who we're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. I'm going to give you a, a quick run down some of the texts in the Bible that talk about this relationship thing. And, and, and it, say, it says in, in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 4.9, it was written by Solomon, who's the wisest man who ever lived in the Old Testament time. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. For the, if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. Uh, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and no one's there to lift him up again. If two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Proverbs, uh, the book of wisdom, chapter 17, verse 17 says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And then we get down to Samuel and we see one of those relationships between Samuel, him, uh, between Jonathan and David. Jonathan and David love each other so much. And, and it says in that text, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the, so, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as he loved his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. You see, these guys had a deep, abiding, respect, and loving relationship for each other because they knew that they were better together, but yet they were being torn apart. And all through the Bible, we see this people thing. When Daniel is taken down by Nebuchadnezzar into the Babylonian kingdom and they're told not to eat, Daniel has three friends with him. Y'all remember who Daniel's three friends in the early days were? Can anybody name them? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's not there by himself. He's there with his friends so he can go through the things he's going through. Even Job. Job, when his world comes to an end, he loses his family, he loses his house, he loses his stuff, he loses his health. And what's the first thing that happens to him? Three of his friends come up and they spend... This is, this is, a, this is a friend. They spend seven days with their mouth shut. Don't even say a word. They just show up. Now, if they'd have kept their mouth shut, they'd have probably been better off, okay? But, but they come in to try to do what they can do with him in a situation. The whole Bible is built on these relationships. I'm going to tell you that I tried, to, I tried to do this this week, and I couldn't do it. I was going to go into the New Testament and read the name of everybody that Paul wrote about in the New Testament. Every time he mentioned a name, I was going to write it down. I couldn't get it done for this week's sermon because Paul has got so many relationships and so many people involved in his life. And every one of them is a different kind of a relationship, a different particular situation. Now, the Scripture is also emphatic that as you have relationships, you've got to pay attention to those relationships that are in there because it matters. Um, you know, parents, many of you parents in here, if your kids are going to go off with somebody, what's the first thing you ask the kids? Who, who are you going with? Who are you going? Does it matter who your kids run around with? Absolutely. And you know, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, don't be deceived. Bad company ruins morals. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise will become wise, but whoever's companions are fools will suffer harm. Proverbs 27, 9, oil and perfume make a glad heart, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. So that's goodness in it. Um, second. Corinthians 6.14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership is righteousness have with lawlessness or what fellowship has light to do with darkness. So we have, God gives us relationships, but he tends for those relationships to be in the right light that they're in. As Paul closes out his letter to the Colossian church, he mentions seven particular names. And I want you to look at these names. And I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of them, but, but they're real people with real situations. Each name is a person that Paul has a relationship with. What I want us to do today is look at Paul's relationship with these people and learn from him not only how important individual people are in your life, but how without them you cannot become who you're supposed to become in Christ. And without them you'll never accomplish what God has called you to accomplish in your life. So having said that, let's go read the text. And if you don't mind, when you laugh at my reading, if you would do it so I can't hear it, I would appreciate it. Okay. All right. Colossians chapter 4, beginning of verse 7. Ficus will tell you all about the activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage 
your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful, beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Artachius, my fellow prison, uh, prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Now, I want you to know right up front that that's John Mark, the guy that wrote the book of Mark. Concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, but now, now this is not Jesus who died on the cross. This is Jesus also called justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers of the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Ephesus, who is one of you, a slave of Christ Jesus, greets you always, struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear, I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hipparolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give, give my greetings to the brother, it's at brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha, the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. And then Paul puts his own signature at the end of the letter. And he writes these, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my change. And then look at these last four words. Grace be with you. And all God's people said. Amen. Man, there is so much in that chapter. There's so much contained in there. But what I want to do is I just want to look at these people. And, and I do want to remind you that the book of Acts and the book of Luke are both written by Luke, the, the beloved physician. He wrote both of those. He writes the book of Luke, then he turns around and writes the book of Acts. And while he's traveling through Acts, he's traveling with Paul through the second half of that chapter. And, and, and he builds up that relationship with Paul. But one of the things that we see about Luke, about, about Paul in his ministry, he never ministers alone. He's always got other people with him in all the ministry that he does. He, there's one time in all of the book of Acts where we see where Paul leaves his group for one week, maybe 10 days, maybe up to two weeks. He runs over to Athens while the guys back in, in Corinth, where he's at, to finish up the ministry that they were there so he could go and prepare for those guys to come and be with him. But that's the only time in all the writings of the Bible that we see where Luke is doing, doing something on his own and he's just getting ready for the other guys to come then. But then we look and we start seeing these people that are beginning to get information. And we, we, we can see a lot in their lives by what Paul has mentioned about them in the Scriptures. The first one I want to talk about is Tychius. Paul called him, listen to this, a fellow servant. He said he had a servant's heart. You may... You, in a casual reading, you probably never noticed this in the Bible, but there are three of the letters that are contained in the Bible. Thacius is the very one who takes the letter to the places that he takes them. Paul has got such a relationship with this guy that he sees him as a fellow servant. You see that word fellow? That word fellow means he's one of us. Now, we're all different in here, but there's some people in here when you say one of us, you mean something different about them. You see them as your peers. I see them as my peers. Those people who have like abilities, those people who have like working natures in them. So just there's something that bonds them together because they see things from the same perspective. And that's when he, when he talked about Tychius. He's talking about he was, he was like Paul, and he was like Paul in that he was able to teach the Scriptures. He was like Paul in the fact that he understood what the Old Testament said, how that applied to the New Testament, and how to teach that and explain it to the people he came in contact with. And that's why he would carry the letters from place to place. So when the people had questions about the letters, that Paul had sent, he could just give them, he, well, he was there with Paul when he wrote it, he could explain to him what Paul meant by that. So there wouldn't be any question about what Paul was trying to say. Paul, there was a couple of times in Scripture where we see where Paul would go to one place, start a church, he would leave that church and he'd go to the next place. Guess who he left behind? 
he would leave Phacius behind to continue to build up the church members because Paul knew that he understood what Paul understood so that he could make sure that it was strength in their wisdom. And he knew that he was a fellow servant and he would help the kingdom instead of harming the kingdom. So he was a fellow. He was a peer. He was a close friend to Paul. And then the next guy that we see in the scripture that's mentioned right there is a guy by the name of Onesimus. Does anybody remember who Onesimus is? There's a whole book of the Bible that's about nothing but Onesimus. Does anybody know what that book of the Bible is? Philemon. Philemon. You know how many chapters Philemon has in it? One. It's not a very long book, but it's a book about Onesimus. You see, Onesimus was a radically changed individual. He was a strong, headstrong, head-wheeled individual who wanted to do whatever he wanted to do. He was a slave to a master. And what he did is he stole the money from his master, he left town, and he went running. And when he went running before too long, he wound up in prison. They took him in prison, and they threw him in the prison, and they threw him in the cell. And guess who his cellmate was in prison? Doesn't that sound just like my luck? Wind up being thrown in a jail cell with the most godly man on the face of the earth. So what does Paul begin to do? Paul begins to start pouring into this guy, explaining to him who Jesus Christ is and how we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory and how, how Paul begins to take the scriptures that he's got and take Onesimus and share with him who Christ is. And now it comes time for Onesimus to get out of jail where Paul has been, but Paul is still in jail. But Paul looks at Onesimus and says, Look, Onesimus, you're never going to be able to go forward with your life until you go back and clean up the mess that you left behind. So go back and clean up that mess, and God will do great things with you in the future. Those of you who have been through one of those 12-step programs, you know one of the things you've got to do is go back to those people and make amends to those people. Onesimus had to take the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon and go back and straighten things out so that he could move forward. But he was also from Colossa, where the church of Coloss was. And he was a transformed individual. And Paul had that relationship with him because he was his father in the ministry to carry him into who he would be in Christ Jesus. Some of you in here today have been radically changed by the power of God. Aristarchus, he had been with Paul and was in prison with Paul. On numerous occasions, Paul gets thrown in jail. Now, usually when Paul would get thrown in jail, what would happen is Paul would stand out with a group of people who would stand up with him. And the closer he got to being thrown in jail, the more the people would leave and leave him by himself until Paul would be left all alone. But not Archias. Arista, whatever his name is. Archie, let's call him Archie for right now, okay? Except for Archie. See, Archie would stand next to Paul no matter what was going through because he was a friend that would stick closer than a brother. Through thick and thin. When Paul got thrown in prison, he got thrown in prison. However long Paul stayed in prison, this guy stayed in prison. He was just there with him. He was with him. You know what? You know, you know what their bond was? Like suffering. They'd been through the same junk together. One of the things I found in ministry is there's some people I'm just not able to minister to. I mean, I go and I hug them and I tell them I love them and I tell them I'm praying for them. I show them what the Bible says. But, you know, when I run into a family who's lost a child, I'm kind of at a loss because I don't know what it is to be them. God's blessed me. I've still got my children. But then I'll watch this person that maybe loses a child and I try to go and minister to them. But then somebody else will come across the room and come over to them and they'll say, well, you know, I kind of understand what you're going through because 10 years ago my wife and I, we lost our child. And what happens is immediately those two faces make eye contact. And they've got a common suffering in them that causes them to be able to understand each other in a deeper way than all the other people are able to understand. That's the kind of relationship that Archie had with Paul in this particular situation. They'd been through the same stuff, so they knew what it was like in their suffering. The next one that we see is John Mark. Everybody say John Mark. Now, John Mark, y'all remember who John Mark was? 
Oh, we, in the book of Acts, we got four of Paul's missionary journeys. On the first missionary journey that he goes on, Barnabas comes along and says, Look, I got this young nephew, man. I tell you, he is awesome. We're going to take him with us. And Paul goes off on his journey. And while he's off on his journey, Paul works 16 hours a day. And when he's supposed to be sleeping, he prays. He doesn't eat for two or three days. They get robbed. They get beat. Everywhere Paul goes, he gets stoned. He gets up. He goes somewhere else. And everywhere. And John Mark is dragging with him. And after about six weeks of this, you know what John Mark says? Forget this. I didn't sign up for this. This wasn't in the job description. I want my mama. So he leaves Paul and he goes back to his mama. All right. Paul goes on, finishes his mission. They go back to the church at Antioch. He gets back to the church at Antioch. Church of Antioch says, we're going to send you in Barnabas. Y'all did such a good job last time. We're going to send you off on a mission again. And Paul says, okay. So they get ready to send them off. And Barnabas says, well, wait a minute. Let me go get John Mark. And Paul says, say what? We ain't taking that little mama's boy. Well, this is the Steve Celo translation. We ain't taking that little mama's boy back with us. He broke last time. And Barnabas says, yeah, but you just don't know how much he's changed. No, I don't want to have anything to do with him. It winds up separating Paul and Barnabas, and each of them go in opposite directions to do ministry, and both of them have a successful ministry. But look where we are 15, 20 years later now. Paul's with John Mark. Why? One thing is, John Mark ain't the baby he used to be. He's been through a bunch of junk, and he's a recreated man. Paul's had plenty of time to think about what went down on that other journey. Paul's changed. John Mark has changed. John Mark and Paul have changed so much that in the weeks before Paul is going to be put to death, he writes a letter and says, send John Mark. To me. He's useful to me. Have him pick up my coat, bring it to me, and get those parchments so we can talk about that scripture when he gets here. See, John Mark was a man of second chances. Paul was the kind of man that John Mark gave him an opportunity to extend the second chance to. Because we all need second chances, third chances, fourth chances. And then we see justice, but we don't see a whole lot about justice. Paul had kind of been blackballed by the Jewish community. You know, there's the Messianic Jews, the Jews that came to know Christ really didn't want to be around Paul that much because everywhere Paul went, he shook everything up. Paul, every time he'd go into a synagogue, he'd get thrown out of the synagogue or he'd get some stone or he'd have to leave the, uh, the, like he did Damascus over the wall, get the, out of the basket and they'd let him out and, and all kinds of stuff. So the Jews really didn't much want anything to do with him, but John Mark, who was a Jew, and Justice, who was a Jew, and this other guy that was with him was a Jew, they're the only ones that he still had from like relationships. You see, their childhoods were very similar. You know, I noticed in my younger days, not so much now, but in my younger days, when you'd run across two people that had gone through the Depression, they may not have known each other. But when they start talking about the Depression, there was a kindred relationship between the two. And there was just instant respect between the two of them because of stuff they'd been through. Paul had that kind of relationship with justice and with John Mark because they're the only ones who stuck with him. And then Ephesus, Ephesus was the one who left Colossa to go to Paul to get the letter to bring back because he's the one who had ch- planted the church over there. It's like that. He was a servant who planted the church, but he was passionate for his home church. He always wanted to make sure that all the relationships that were there were done well. He was, he was an advocate. Whenever Paul and the guys would be talking about other churches and stuff, yeah, what about the church? What about the Colossian church? We got to make sure we take care of them because they're right over there by Laodicea. We want to take it to the Colossians and the Laodiceans because we know, man, we know they got them Gnostics over there and we, we just got to stand up for them. And Paul and he learned how to develop people together. So... Paul sends Ephesus back so that he can continue to develop the people so that he can do what Paul's not able to do because Paul's in prison. So they have a like relationship. And then the scripture also talks about Dr. Luke, the physician. This is where it calls him the physician. He's probably the one throughout the book of Acts who is right there to make sure that all of Paul's conditions are taken care of. You know, after you've been stoned to death once and 
stoned a whole bunch of other times and beaten and robbed and spent two or three days in the water from shipwrecks and all that kind of stuff. You're not in the best of health anymore. Paul has an affirmity. He asks God to remove it from him. God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. But Luke is there to be a personal doctor, to be see it, to make sure that he's okay so that he can do what he's called to do. Last and certainly least, we see Demas. You know, there's no mention of Demas in that text other than and Demas. Now, there's a reason it just says and Demas because Demas was an imposter. He was somebody who was just trying to act like he was Paul's friend. See, he never came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. If you jump over to the book of Luke chapter uh, chapter 4 and second, excuse me, Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, you'll see where it says, For Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me, and he's gone back to Thessalonica. You see, anybody whose faith falters is somebody who had a, a, a fatal flaw from the first because they didn't hang on to Christ. And Paul was able to tell that in that person. He, he gave him every opportunity. He loved on him, giving him time. Because Paul was a man of grace. But this man loved the world more than he did Christ. I do want to, before I go into the closing statement, I do want to point out something, though, about the book of Colossians. Chapter 2, I mean, chapter 1, verse 2, Paul says, Grace be unto you. And the last four words that Paul says, Grace unto you. It's like he puts some parentheses around the book. Grace and grace. Because when you deal with relationships, there's got to be grace. Sure, tough things have got to be talked about. Tough situations have got to be handled. But always let grace abound. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Where extra oof is needed, grace abounds. And God supplies that need. I close out the message by saying this. Number one, God has placed all kinds of people around you to develop you and to help you accomplish your God-given works. Who are they? Who has He put around you to do the works? They're not there by accident. God's got them there on purpose. Just like God's got you in their life on purpose so that you can help them become who they're supposed to be. Secondly, pray for your fellow workers as Paul did. I know you pray, Lord, help me know what to do in this particular situation, but maybe sometimes you need to pray, Lord, help so-and-so as they're working out that situation in their family. Pray for the others as well. Number three, be aware of those who are pulling you away from Christ and towards the world. There will be some that come into the church to try to pull the church back to the world. Watch out for them. And what, that's those relationships the Bible's telling you to watch out for. And then lastly, I just ask this question to you. What friends are you helping to carry out their good work? Because if we're not careful, all we'll worry about is what we're supposed to be doing when we might be the ones who are supposed to be helping them. Because it's not all about us. It's not all about them. In fact, let me tell you this. It's never about you. And it's never about them. It is always about Jesus. Look around. Work with others to accomplish the Great Commission. And Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. So we work together for the sake of the gospel. Lord God in heaven.